and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who's a CONCACAF Nations League convert. His name <laughs> is Taylor Rockwell and he believes in the competition. Hello. And just like the people who used to convert other people, you've decided for me, it sounds like? Yes. Okay. Will, will you take this leaflet? <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> I think I am. I'm still not quite where you are on this one because it is still like a Cuba game that we were on extra time earlier yeah. and the conversation was like, we usually beat this team a lot. A lot of people have beaten this team a lot. Should we beat them a lot? Yeah. It was sort of the gist of the conversation, at least to start. I think in terms of CONCACAF Nations League, mm-hmm. people will be more excited about it when we get to the knockout rounds in June, mm-hmm. where essentially competition is tougher. Yes. Fair? I think it will be... I think people won't be truly excited until like maybe the final game, and then it will maybe you mean build USA Mexico, yeah, which will then build enthusiasm for the next iteration. But whenever there's yeah. the introductory one, the inaugural tournament, it uh-huh. maybe takes a little bit of time, especially when it's a tournament played over different weeks and months and at different points. And yeah. t- some teams have played each other twice, and some teams haven't played at all. And we should set the stage, right? Yeah. So this Friday night, the USA plays Cuba mm-hmm. in the Concacaf Nations League. It's the US's first game. We're in a three-team group with Cuba and Canada. So we play uh, Cuba at home on Friday, Canada away on Tuesday. Then next month, November, we do the reverse, and that's the group stage over, mm-hmm. right? And if we win the group, yeah. we go to the knockout rounds in June. And if we finish second, we qualify for the Gold Cup, but everybody uh, sets their computers on fire and Twitter explodes. <laughs> and if we finish goes. third, we get relegated to the lower tier of the CONCACAF Nations League. We're hoping that doesn't that happen. probably won't happen. Right now, the United States has not played a game. As I said, Canada and Cuba have played each other twice. Uh, already. twice. Yeah, they've done uh, it. United States currently in second, which tells you how poorly it's gone for <laughs> Cuba. So yeah, Canada won 6-0 mm-hmm. and 1-0. Different? Yeah. 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 And I would actually, I'm glad we started there because I would like caution people, encourage people to remember that. Worth noting the 6 0 uh, result. It was 2 0 at halftime. It took Canada, I think, 16, 17 minutes to get that first goal. Yeah. Then it took them almost to the end of the first half to get that second. So all I'm saying is that if it's not like 1 0 inside the first 15, that yeah. is not the end of the world. All right. If it's not 1 0 at the end of the game, that might be the end of the world. <laughs> so should we talk a little bit about Cuba and what to expect before we get into the US? We're not going to like spotlight multiple players because Cuba, frankly, are not a great team. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we were watching footage of Cuba versus Canada... They were still not a great team. <laughs> they were still not a great team. They had very specific <laughs> yeah. weaknesses yeah, that yeah. we'll talk about. But they weren't what I expected, which yeah, was a team agreed. that would sit in a low block and hold everybody back and just defend for their lives at the top of the area. They came out against Canada, who I assume they will treat similarly to the United States, Yes, um, in a Mm mid-block, meaning they didn't all collapse backwards. They kind of held the line just over the halfway line, Mm -hmm. right? So not not as cowardly as I would have expected. So salute to Cuba for playing a more... Um, a braver a braver formation than we thought. Agreed. Yeah. And two things there. The first would be, yeah, when we were on Extra Time, uh, second reference, you should watch that or listen yeah. to it. Um, we That is kind of how we discussed them. It's like, okay, they're going to be defensive. How are we going to break down this bunker? Yeah. And it was exciting to see that that's not what Cuba do. And mm-hmm. I agree with you. The second thing would be that I don't think that's a thing. I hope at least, maybe it's a little bit hope and a little bit actual informed thought. <laughs> um, I don't think that's what they'll do against us either because at this point, you've already lost both games. It's not like you're going to sit back in bunker and maybe get like a point away and win at home against the United States. I think for Cuba, it seems to be developing their style of play, similar to what the United States was doing, sort of learning how to play maybe a bit more like mid-block system, because that's not a thing we've seen from them in the past. This time around, that seems to be what they're doing. But here's the interesting thing. What's that? Here's the weakness, I think. Mm -hmm. They play that mid-block. We can, I think the way the US plays, we'll pass it around and force them backwards, so they'll end up low. Do you mean the weakness aside from the fact that most of their squad is based in Cuba? Yeah, yeah, there is Mm -hmm. that. Um, I think we'll end up forcing them backwards, and then it will be a lower block. But what they seem really bad at mm-hmm. for, from the we, yeah we watch a lot of footage mm-hmm. is counter attacking. They re, once they do win the ball back or, or there's a turnover in possession, Cuba try to go and they try to go at pace, and they seem to be not fully in control of the ball, Mm-mm. and they will often sort of be mid counter attack and lose possession. And suddenly they'll be in trouble. Yeah. It's, and it's, that's where the opportunity is for the United States. It's the old joke about, like, your dog won't know what to do once it catches the car. <laughs> it's a little bit like Cuba get that ball and it's it's a bit more like, we got it, everybody go. Like, it does not yes. feel like it, it's a coordinated system. And I would say it's bad when they try to play out 
playing quick passes. It's bad when they dribble. It's bad when they go long because a lot of times those forwards have dropped in to try to kind of facilitate a counter. Yeah. So when the ball is played long, it ends up going all the way back to the opposition goalkeeper or to one of Canada's defenders yep. when they were playing against Canada. So, so I, I, I agree with you entirely because not only – is that a problem for them in creating attacking opportunities? I think the point you're getting at is that also going with the kind of new new age idea of you're most vulnerable when you have just gotten the ball back and are yeah. counterattacking. That is where, for example, that lone goal in Cuba, it comes from nice keeping winning the ball back. Thank you. For, for, for it being in Cuba, I will say Cuba, uh, and then I will stop forever stop <laughs> before people turn the podcast off. I apologize already. <laughs> but that was them, Cuba, getting the ball, trying to like uh, transition out. Actually, I think they drew a free kick, and from the free kick, they passed it straight to Canada. Yep. Canada go right back down and score. So Cuba trying to play a little bit, I think, causes them problems. Cuba also going long it causes them problems because then they cede possession. And then here's how this plays out for the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I think that we might have trouble with the um, possession, pulling them out of position, trying to ex- trying to open up defences. Um, if because they are quite disciplined mm-hmm. in the sort of four four two ish shape that they hold defensively, I think when they counter attack, that's going to be when we can hit them yep. and hurt them. So we've got to let them catch the car. Yeah, we've got to let them catch the car hmm. and then and then get in behind when they're a bit disorganised. Yes, it's not necessarily the Berhaltian way, but I think it'll be our most uh, our most productive route. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to, okay, this is a bold, I think kind of a bold statement for me because I've been pretty down on Greg Berhalter. I think this might be the game that I'm going to push all my chips in on Greg Berhalter here. And if it does not go well, I think I may like definitively sour on him. But here, it, from everything we saw, especially in the Canada-Cuba game, in which Canada won 6-0, there were so many opportunities for Canada to do exciting things from an attacking standpoint, some of which they did, some of which they did not. But I kept seeing things that – like opportunities presented against Canada that if they're presented against the United States, allow the U.S. to do a lot of what they've been trying to do, of sort of interchanging positions to throw Canada off, of finding space between the lines for Cuba? attackers to occupy. Uh, yes, of – of like moving the ball around the back to pull the Cuban like two forwards because they do sort of do this like weird intermittent pressing where like one will go and the other one will stay or both of them will go running. It's a bit like what the U.S. was yeah. doing and we didn't like exactly. Yeah. But and if there's a if our number six, whomever that might be for this game, we'll talk about that in a second. But if if he can kind of drop in and show he can split those two, suddenly now everybody's pulled out of position. And I yeah. think if the U.S. are able to quickly move the ball and possess, yeah, they will look very good. There are the space between the lines yeah. in Cuba's mid. Setup. Mm-hmm. There is space between the defensive line and the midfield line, which, for example, like we would expect the tens, mm-hmm. Pulisic and the eight slash ten, McKenney say, to find space in there, and then it's about feeding the ball to them, and then being able to receive and turn mm-hmm. and, and sort of you know make things happen from there. Yes, and and with that said, the reason why I feel like this is more than just an opportunity to beat up an opponent who isn't on the same level is because there are other elements in there. It's not just, okay, they're going to play two banks of four, there's going to be space in between. A thing that you noted is that Canada, or excuse me, uh, Cuba and off-air you noted this, Cuba very narrow in that four four two, yes. which means there's tons of space out wide. Because yeah. especially... they narrow and then they sort of, press is the wrong word, but pressure laterally. I'd say shift over laterally. Shift over yeah, laterally, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so say if the US is going down the right side, mm-hmm. uh, Cuba's like entire team will shuffle over to that side. Mm-hmm. And that means the, there'll be masses of space on the US left wing to attack. Yeah. So big switches of play. Um, I think will be key. I think yeah. we can draw them over, switch it fast, and then the space to attack. Imagine right. if it's like Pulisic has pulled wide. Mm-hmm. Switch it over to Christian Pulisic. Suddenly he has a bit of space ahead of him to get up ahead of steam and dribble at them. Yeah. I think that could be another key to attacking Cuba. And so to go back to it, this is why I say like, not that I have been like, like this is it, everybody. This is when we're going to see the US like do it. And Greg Berhalter was right the whole time. But everything we're talking about is there are so many potential opportunities or vulnerabilities, depending on your perspective that the United States could exploit and it seems like it's stuff they've been working on. Those diagonals are things we've heard Burhalter talk about yeah. that those could be on. So, like line splitting passes from the center backs, those mm-hmm. could be on. The number six I dropping mean, in, the number six dropping in, to, or number eight dropping in to help support the number six yeah. and find like co- combination one twos. And we have we have three different number sixes mm-hmm. who can hit big diagonal balls. We've yeah. got Michael Bradley, we've got Will Trapp, we got Jackson Yule. Yeah. So one of them's going to be doing it, right? This, yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> At least one of them will be on the field. And then I would also add that like, there are players in this Cuban team that 
like I, against Canada looked completely out of their depth. And we, I think it will be a closer game than it's been in the past against Canada. Uh, but still, the United States has players that are slightly more dominant, I would argue. And like, for example, number five, uh, Morejon, I, I think it is, who sometimes is the right back, sometimes is the left back. Against uh, In the home game, the 1 0 loss to, to Canada, I saw him try to defend 1v1. He didn't do very well. I saw him try to pass out of the back. That didn't go very well. I saw him try to like play in a zone and keep a line. That didn't go very well. So there are also individual. Paul vulnerable- rubbing his That's hands. That's what right I'm now. saying. He's and- thinking, oh, I'm at Audi Field. I've got this right back that's not very good. Mm-hmm. I'm going to combine with Pulisic in front of like maybe some fans that already yeah. know me. Yeah. yeah. And so I think. All of that, again, is, for me, an opportunity for the United States to showcase we can beat people one-on-one, we can beat people with long diagonals, we can beat people with clever passes through the middle, we can find space, we can find time, we can get good shots, we can create opportunities and get yeah. some goals. And, I, and I, I guess that's my hope, is even if it's against Cuba, even if it's a team that historically we have beaten up on, it could be an opportunity to not just beat them because we're individually better, yeah. but because we also play much better as a team. Okay, so before we move on to like picking what we think should be our 11, mm-hmm. I know we've got ads to get to as well. I think it's worth uh, go, like sharing a bit of news. Mm-hmm. So since we last talked about the 26-man U.S. squad, it's become a 25-man U.S. squad. It has. Josie Altador mm-hmm. has pulled out through injury. He got injured playing for Toronto on decision day. A calf injury seems to be the calf most injury. specific information I could find. Yeah, I mean, he went, I've seen the video where yeah. he goes down. It, it looks, yeah, it mm-hmm. looks like a calf injury. So Altador was obviously removed from the squad through injury, which is sadly a thing we keep saying, right? Yep. He's either just coming back from injury or just been removed through injury. He has not been replaced. They just went from 26 to 25. It'll be a 23-man match day squad. Mm-hmm. So the strikers on the squad are Jassi Zardes, mm-hmm. And Josh Sargent. Yeah, if you if you look at the attacking options, like the six that are listed, it's telling that it's six. It's like four wide players, two, two strikers. Goals. To me, that says three of you are going to play one game, three of you are going to play another game. Oh, really? Game. I mean, it probably won't be that like for like, but I imagine... I'd be surprised if we see much of Corey Bad. I will probably get some substitute appearances from him. That's probably remember fair. This is, remember, this is a, an official game, right? There's only three substitutions. I feel like... That's I'm just saying, thing. no, we, don't, we can't do the six I know, no, no, no. I know. I'm, I'm just laughing that, like, th- that is a very good point. You're correct. Yeah. But I also feel like that's a thing that, like, Burhalter is going to have to tell his squad. U.S. soccer is going to have to tell Burhalter. U.S. soccer is going to have to tell the fans, like, hey, guys, this is real. This matters. Like, like remember, <laughs> remember, this is official. I'm just saying not everybody's yeah, going to yeah. get to play because mm-hmm. there's, there's only three subs. So I wouldn't expect many minutes for Corey yeah. Bad. Just saying. No. Uh, the other injury, okay. Walker Zimmerman, mm-hmm. I think got a head injury, right? There was a, concussion. a head. Yep. He got a concussion. Oh, mm-hmm. Okay, so we hope he's okay. Yep. But he had to pull out the squad. He was. It was, re- it was a bad concussion. He I was add. replaced by Miles Robinson, was pulled up from the U23. So he was in the September squad and he played. Uh, Miles Robinson is back with the first team. Which has to, it's not just a positive because it's a young central defender that I think we're both excited about. Yes. It also shows that, like, Berhalter has not hesitated to not call people back up or even drop people if they don't do what he's asking and don't fit the system. This, to me, indicates that Miles Robinson was maybe on the bubble. He wanted to let him be with the U23s, but because of the injury... I'm, I'm assuming then he blended in very well in those sept- in that September camp. Yep. So Miles Robinson gets the call. Yep. I also saw an interview with, uh, so it was Brian Sharetta interviewed Jason mm-hmm. Christ, the U23 coach, who was basically saying, I think it's great when I lose players to the senior squad because it's about me and Bear Halter working together. He said together. Teeth, though. I no, love it. But it's he said, favorite. then because the qualification uh, uh, mm-hmm. tournament, the yeah. Olympic qualification tournament that the U23s will be in is not until March. He said, we're not actually working on like, team stuff mm-hmm. right now it's more just player evaluation so like he didn't say this specifically but he already knows Robinson's qualities so it's actually a chance to just look at another centre back yeah. you know what I mean so it's more he can evaluate someone else Robinson's going to be part of that um, U23 team um, if it's based on picking the best players right? I would assume yeah. so yes alright we don't know if Robinson will get any minutes um, against Cuba or if he's just there to be part of the squad I would venture to guess he likely will not likely will not mm-hmm. um, okay mm-hmm. before we get to some other news now starting 11 let's get to today's first sponsor all right it's our friends at Fubo TV they are our friends sometimes my best friend I think <laughs> is a streaming option but I'm fine with that and, and like a, a non-human as my best friend whatever yeah. it's cool so Fubo TV is my replacement for cable yeah. I moved house in the mm-hmm. past couple weeks uh, time really is a flat circle. I've got no idea how long ago <laughs> it was, but um, I won't name my former. What do you have ca- other stuff going on? Or I won't. Yeah, I have had other stuff going on. I won't name my former cable provider, but they are my former cable provider. I now just have Fubo TV on my Apple TV. I go in there and I have 
all kinds of soccer channels to choose from. I have 500 hours on my cloud DVR. I am indiscriminately recording things. Mm -hmm. I've still only managed to fill like 20 hours. So now it's a, com it's a it, and the nice thing with it, oh, though, I'm going to try and get to 500. Well, but you know that thing when you get the new computer and it's got like 500 gigabytes and you're like, I'll never even scratch that. And yeah, then a yeah. year later, you're like, I have no free space anymore. It is nice that you yeah. have such a vast amount of space, but obviously you can easily delete and it's yep. all easy. But it is worth noting. It's also easier than ever to record a game, which is the thing you pointed out to me today, because obviously obviously with DVR you can schedule and you can hit record and it's not that difficult to begin yeah. with, but Fubo have made it even easier and even like better for fans of soccer. Yeah, so here's what you do. If you um, catch, catch any game late, mm -hmm. like we did with um, Netherlands Northern Ireland yep. today, even if you tune in in the 80th minute and you press record, it will backfill. Right. So you will get that game recorded from the start. I think for most like normal TV watchers, that wouldn't be such a big deal. For soccer fans, that's huge, right? It's huge to be like, oh, I've only got the last 10 minutes of this game. Oh, no, wait, I can get the full 90. I... I I, you can hear recording the 89th minute just as the uh, added time board is going I, up. This is You'll get the you. whole game. See, okay, I, I was wondering about that because I almost don't want to believe you because that seems too good to be true because <laughs> so often I will come in on a movie that I enjoy that is not available on the other 17,000 streaming services that are out there, yeah, yeah. and I really want to watch, but I've only seen the last 10 minutes. But if you get to record that... Then you can go back and watch the very beginning, and it's yes. TVR. It's very nice. You can skip through the go. parts you don't want to so watch. You do that with a soccer match. Yeah. You can see when Northern Ireland took the lead, mm -hmm. and you can see when Netherlands scored three goals in the last 10 minutes mm -hmm. to make it 3-1. Spoiler alert for that game. <laughs> yeah. Slight spoiler alert, but it's fine. But it, but also like because uh, they have the feature uh, Fubo do that everything that's there that's broadcast on Fubo is available for three days after it's on demand. Yes. You don't but even have to press record; you, you can still get it. You don't. But the difference again is that with some of that on demand stuff on certain channels, you cannot fast forward, especially with the soccer games. You have to kind of watch them as they were, as they happened. And so if you're trying to skim through to get the gist of the game, then being able to DVR it in the final minute, but then go back and watch the whole thing if you want yes. to, again, much easier for soccer fans. So here's the other thing that convinced me slash is, people who do weekend reviews is that <laughs> Fubo recently added um, a whole raft of new soccer channels uh -huh. so you know Univision mm -hmm. Deportes they've rebranded as T-U-D-N mm -hmm. so I think there's a way like a Spanish language way of pronouncing it but T-U-D-N um, is how it shows up there are also 11 extra channels called mm -hmm. like T-U-D-N extra 1 2 3 4 all the way through 11 they're all filled with soccer content. So, for example, this weekend, when it's um, international friendlies and Euro 2020 qualifiers, instead of just whichever game Univision had decided to show, there's now 12 games like happening all at once. So, basically, they saw Dodgeball like a decade ago, and they were like, yeah. we need more than eight channels. They've already <laughs> done ESPN 8, the Ocho. We need... Onse? I forget. I think that's 11. <laughs> so to give you a quick preview of sort of uh, the next few days on Fubo, the stuff I'm going to be watching. First of all, USA Cuba, Fox Sports 1, mm -hmm. Friday night. Then, But before that, Friday afternoon, Czech Republic versus England, Euro 2020 qualifier on TUDN Extra 2, 2.45 mm -hmm. p.m. I will be uh, DVRing that because we'll be in the car on the way to, to D.C. That we will. Yeah. Uh, you've got other exciting games this coming weekend from the international break. You've got Costa Rica Curacao also in the CONCACAF Nations League. That's mm -hmm. TUDN slash Unimas uh, available on both, I believe. Uh, but that's a Curacao team that have done uh, decently well so far. Yeah, and a Costa Rica team points? that like is um, trying to rebuild, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a chance that Curacao, they have a chance against Costa Rica. Right? And who have not played. I think it's another one of those Curacao have... Four, I forget the other team in that group. But Haiti. Haiti. That's why it's so exciting. I think it's like three teams that could all conceivably mm -hmm. win that group. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but it's like with Curacao already on four, Haiti with one. So if they can get points here against Costa Rica, decent chance that uh, Curacao are able to advance out oh, of this one. So that makes it really interesting brilliant. for me. France, Turkey uh, is another one. I believe that's Monday. Uh, that's on TUDN, TUDN Extra One. Yep. Uh, but that is Turkey currently on top of that Euro qualifier group, Ooh. three points ahead of, of France, I believe it is. Okay. Or no, maybe they're level, but uh, goal or head to head is different because Turkey won the first one. So okay. either way, lots to play for between those two. And uh, also it's Turkey, who I'm a, a, a slight fan of, less so somewhat these days, but also <laughs> France. Uh, you know, I yeah. feel like they're decently good at soccer. Could be wrong. Another game obviously worth watching. Mm -hmm. Canada versus the United States is on TUDN. Tuesday night, 7.20 p.m. is when the programming starts. So Yee. Tuesday night. So I'll be in Boston. Uh, I know that we're staying in um, accommodation that doesn't have a TV. I'll have Fubo with me. I just log in at Fubo. I'll be able to watch 
Canada versus US on my laptop or my iPad, however I want to do it. And then I'll be able to record the review show with you. I'm excited for it. Yeah. I'm excited for it, my friend. If listeners would like to give Fubo a try Mm -hmm. and then get $10 off their first three months, they go to FuboTV.com slash TSS. That's FuboTV.com slash TSS. You'll get a one-week free trial. You'll get the very nice reminder when your one-week free trial is almost up, which I think is a really nice, honest thing that Fubo do. They're not not trying trying to to scam your money. They're not trying to trick you into getting the full thing. So you get the one-week free trial, then you get $10 off of your first first three months of Fubo TV. FuboTV.com slash TSS. The link will be in the show notes. I recommend Fubo enough that I've, I use it myself. <laughs> I recommend, I recommend Fubo enough that I use it myself. It's like a 50, I'm on a 50s advert. <laughs> I love that, Daryl. Well done, sir. Well done, sir. All right. Uh, a couple more notes before we get to our lineups, if that works for you. Yeah. Um, I did want to remind everyone, like, uh, I'm going to be that guy. Uh, if you have not yet been to a game at Audi Field, or maybe you've you've forgotten, yeah. uh, Audi Field is all digital. So if you've purchased your tickets, oh, know mobile that, pass yeah, thing, printing yeah. them off, not going to be as effective. Or like, don't yes. worry if you don't have physical t- tickets, because all you need is the, uh, the barcode. I have an extra tip for mobile pass. What's that? As well, so many people will be trying to do it at one time. Sometimes there won't be enough like network data available in the mm-hmm. air. Um, make sure you like take a screenshot of it in advance, mm-hmm. right? So you can just pull it up on your camera, um, so you don't have to go open in the app when everybody else is trying to open the app and access that LTE at the yeah. same time. Be a yeah. pro. Be a pro. Be a pro. Be prepared, and also maybe buy tickets because there are <laughs> many still available. I believe. Are there really? I think so. At okay. least so there. Are, uh, we're going to be there, right? We're we'll going to be there. there at this game. We're going to drive up to DC. We're going to mm-hmm. watch this game at. Our Audi field. We sure Before are. we pick our 11s, there's been the Greg Bearhalter. I like that we keep doing before. We're like trying to preempt each other. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like we're both keen to get to the 11s, but I want to make sure we hit everything first. The Greg Bearhalter press conference, the big news coming out of it is Josh Sargent will start mm-hmm. this game. Right. We know there were people out there fearing another Jassy Zider start over Josh Sargent. Josh Sargent will start this game against Cuba, which is 100% the right call. Mm-hmm. Do you want to get into that now, or should we get into that when we pick our 11s? We can get into our 11s. Uh, okay, I think when we'll, we get into our 11s. Yeah, because yeah. I think you know, it wouldn't mm-hmm. be a spoiler to say that we're both uh, are picking Sargent ahead of Jesse, right? right? Mm-hmm. Uh, two more things that we should talk about from that press conference. Yeah. We obviously were not there, so we didn't uh, hear what was said. It yeah. hasn't been streamed as we're far as I know. We're scraping what we can from Twitter, right? yeah. what people have but, reported. But the other sort of, like like one larger than the other, the smaller talking point is that Zach Steffen has not trained with the team, but apparently is like is good, I think is what I saw, yeah. which my assumption means we see him against Canada, maybe not against Cuba. I think if you haven't trained with the team, it means mm. you're not quite fit, so I wouldn't imagine that you yeah. would be asked to play on a Friday night. Right. Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which I'm sad about because I did. I said this on extra time, third time. I'm plugging that one. Uh, that I wanted to see his I, distribution. I keep, I keep thinking you're forgetting to say the word radio, but they it's rebranded. Strange, right? I, I'm yeah. working very hard on that one. Yes. <laughs> uh, although I think we should now go out and copyright extra time radio as a podcast. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, the other slightly larger talking point with certain sections of Twitter has been a quote by Burhalter. I think asked about. Specifically about Tyler Adams oh, and about yeah, the number yeah. six position, uh, or no? Who could who could replace Michael Bradley eventually? Who's a long term replacement yeah. for Bradley? And he essentially he talked about what Will Trapp and Jackson you will bring. I think with an eye towards this squad, and this is where like I again I don't have any particular love for Greg Berhalter, nor do I have any particular dislike. And so what I'm seeing this as is him saying like from the squad I have, I have it, the actual quote: "It's you will and Trapp, and then Tyler Adams, but." He has a better route, is the gist. Go ahead. So, yeah, I, I'm with you. I think this isn't based on supporting Bearhalter or being against Bearhalter. What I'm against is uh, taking quotes out of context yeah. and making stories out of them that don't mm-hmm. need to be there. So, on TUDN, formerly known as Univision, um, uh, uh, Bearhalter was asked who will succeed Bradley at the six. And he says, the number six, like defensive midfielder, holding midfielder position, you look at a guy like Trapp who has the passing range. Or Jackson Yule, who's young and played well versus Uruguay. Look at Tyler Adams. Can he interpret it in a different way and still be effective? I haven't had him in camp long enough to see that. Mm -hmm. This has been weirdly misinterpreted, especially on Twitter, as Greg Berhalter thinking that Trapp and Yule are better footballers than Tyler Adams. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That is not what he's saying. Mm -mm. Um, He's saying Tyler Adams is a different style of player to passing midfielders like Trapp and Yule. Like in my, in my head, Tyler Adams is a much more high energy, all over the place, just a different mm-hmm. style of game, right? So when he's saying, can he interpret it in a different way and still be effective? I don't know because I haven't seen him in camp long enough. He's saying, I haven't been able to set up my formation with Tyler Adams at the six 
in camp because he hasn't been here because he's always injured. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with him saying that. That is the absolute truth. This is not all about ranking players. That's not how it all works. People always just want, like, is it that Adams is better than Trap? Is it that Bellhalter thinks Trap is better than Adams? Mm-hmm. That's, that's not really how things work, right? It's about... Does he fit into the system the way he plays? And the and Behalter's honest answer is, I don't know because I haven't been able to try it yet. Yeah, nothing wrong with him sharing that. No, and like as, a, as an example, this won't work as well for the listeners. But whatever. If I ask you right now, like, what's your favorite Apple device? And you have your phone in your hand, you're probably gonna be like, oh, I guess my phone. And like in this case, Berhalter is being asked about success, successors to Michael Bradley in a squad that has Michael Bradley and then two of the potential yeah. successors. So he's gonna talk Michael about the Bradley's two. An iMac. Yeah, and then we're looking. Yeah, the, they're the MacBook Airs, I guess. But yeah. um, but like Tyler Adams is an Apple Watch, but Berhalter just yeah. hasn't been able to get his hands on an Apple Watch yet. Sure, um, but naturally he's going to talk about the two who are in the camp, who he's working with every single day. Yeah, and then he will conclude by mentioning, but there's this other player who I want to see, and that's how I take that. Is like, yeah, maybe Tyler Adams can hit that diagonal, but I want to see if he can do it in a way that I want, or in a situation when he's playing for the national team. And it's not all about the diagonal; it's about no. all the other things we've talked about this before, right? So <laughs> many other things go into yeah. that number six role. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, again, like I can understand where Burhalter is coming from with that quote, and but it does seem representative of how people feel about him right now in this national team right now. They're looking that, for an excuse to attack him. Yeah, right? that's where that's where I I want to stand against that. Like we'll criticize him for mm-hmm. when when Berhalter does things that we don't like, but I'm not just going to look for reasons to go after him just because I've decided I'm already against Greg Berhalter. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So okay. don't take quotes out of context and maybe make sure you're getting the full quote before you uh, go insane. There we go. <laughs> Are we now ready to pick our 11? That said, if they talk- don't go do well against Cuba, I will go insane and lose my mind. Of course. And talk <laughs> about how we want to go. Okay, so let's start with this. Mm-hmm. I think Bobby kind of asked us this on Extra Time. The artist formerly known as Extra Time Radio mm-hmm. uh, this morning. Um What is a good result against Cuba? Plug number four. Uh, I think it does not come down to goals. This is what I said then. I'll say it again. Would you take 1-0 like Canada did in that second game? Probably not. Yeah. You wouldn't feel great about that, would you? I would not. Because we went to RFK. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, when we'd only sort of just met each other, right? It was like my third date with my now wife. Right? Yes. And yeah. the USA, I think, won like five or six. That sounds right. Maybe Freddie Adu scored. That sounds weirdly right. Yeah, yes. So, At RFK, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was an absolute beating, and it felt right, mm-hmm. right? So 1-0 would not have felt right. It wouldn't feel right now to me. No. 2-0, I, 3-0? I, like, stop me when I get to an acceptable result. Probably 3-0. 3-0, three, three I think, if it's a comprehensive, like, the United States making things happen. And the weird so thing is... a good is, performance with 3-0 would be great, Yes, right? because... A, a shoddy performance and 3-0 feels weird. But even then... There's, like, it's a balance a little, of performance and goals. Yeah, yeah, but it's a strange thing where, like, but if it's the United States being totally dominant and getting 45 shots on target, but only three go in, then you're like, well, maybe we're not shooting very well, and we got to work on that. Like, so it's still a weird balance, but I would would say that to me it's more about exactly what I've already talked about of can the United States exploit space, find opportunities, put their better players in 1v1s, in yeah. 1v1s that favor the United States. Like If they can do all of the things that they have theoretically, supposedly, if we take Berhalter at his word, actively been working towards, this seems like the opponent that allows us to do all of those things yes. with more ease than, say, Uruguay. Okay, I agree. But also... We've got to remember, again, this is a serious competition. Mm -hmm. It's a group stage. Um, Canada have scored seven goals over two games Mm -hmm. against Cuba. Um, First tiebreaker is goal difference. Canada are a decent opponent, right? We should beat Canada, but there's no guarantee that we will. They have Mm -hmm. a lot of up-and-coming players like Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies. It's going to be a reasonable test when we play Canada home and away. I actually think it's important that we rack up some goal difference against Cuba to take the pressure off of us against Canada. Mm. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because we don't want Canada being able to play for draws against the US knowing that they've got the superior goal difference because they put a bunch of goals past Cuba. So here's, hear me out here. Canada scored seven goals over two games. We need to beat that. So the the minimum I'm putting it at is 4-0 in this game. So we need to be better than three and a half goals a game. I cannot tell you how much more thought you've put into caring about the Nations League than me. Like, <laughs> you are very worried about goal difference. I could not care less about goal difference right now. I really couldn't. You don't be- want to win the group? I Fine, I hope we do. But, like, it's not a thing that I'm going to be like, we got to score five otherwise. Like, no, it's it would be good, but I would rather go beat Canada. And right. I'd rather play very well against we've Canada. We've got to win at least three and a half nil. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, what I would say, though, it's worth remembering that we are still to play Canada next week. Yeah. And there's a decent chance that he, he Berhalter, plays a like B-plus squad or a B squad against Cuba yeah. to be prepared against Canada. It may also be that he wants to get everybody reps. It could go either way. But I'm inclined to think we see a bit more experimentation, which is maybe why he's already announced that we see Josh Sargent. Yes. I am inclined to believe that. That means we see Zardes against Canada. I think... I don't know. I think this is maybe a test for Josh Sargent, and it's the perfect setup to be sort of... We know Josh Sargent is a talented player, right? Is that, you, is that you thinking that, or is that you wanting that to be the case? Both. I genuinely think this, right? I think, for example, the reason... You and I talked about this earlier over lunch, right? The reason Josh Sargent wasn't selected in the Gold Cup squad mm-hmm. is that Bearhalter needed a player who understood the positioning mm-hmm. and movement that goes into the Bearhalter system, right? Right. Altidore had always been injured and hadn't been in the squad yet. So he can't be the guy that already knows the movements, right? And you can only take two strikers. So one of them had to be a guy for already familiar. That's why it was Giassi Zardes, mm-hmm. right? I think that's why, despite his multiple misses in front of goal, Zardes has found so much favor with Berhalter. Yeah. It's because he knows how to fit into the system and where he, can, where he has to be to facilitate everybody else, right? I think if Josh Sargent can prove that he knows where to be, what position to be in, how to fulfill that role. Not just the like the goal scoring stuff, but the how where you're supposed to be to so the system works. If he can prove that he can do that against Cuba, I think he has a good chance of starting against Canada. Okay. All right. Yeah. I can understand and that. I, th- I also I think s- that's fair. I think it's fair to say, can you do all the things I've asked you to do as well as be in this sort of talented uh, goal scoring striker? And once you can, you get to start in the important games um, against Canada, especially when Josh Mirvomi Altador is injured. I still do think that part of that is hope for like you, yeah, yeah. You, there, there's like a but if he does well then maybe uh, which I don't I don't think is the wrong perspective to have on this. But but I would also like the thing that I would like go back to that you were like a point you were making there about like why Zardes kept getting minutes. I agree with everything you said. But there are people out there who would be like, yeah, but like it's his job to be able to explain to a striker how he needs them to play and help them develop. And I think where I am on this, this is my theory. This is not based on anything I've heard or anything I've read. It's just my guess is that if he is so focused on getting his team to play a certain style of soccer, you can only focus on but so many things in training. And if you're focused on getting your midfield to play as a unit and then interchange in certain ways and have your right back become the central midfielder, as we've seen on occasion. or then We've have kind your, of given up on that recently. We, but all I mean to say is that if you're trying to do different tactical things, yeah. you might also be like the oversimplification of it would be you do this and you do this and, you, uh, and Jesse, Jesse just do the stuff you did in Columbus because he already knows it. Yeah, because you don't have time to do yeah. that. And I and I guess my hope is that with the progress quote unquote, that they've made and the understanding that a lot of these players now have, my hope is that he can finally turn his attention to the forward line and be like, okay, here's what we need to do to build sequences and patterns of play and like passing sequences that yeah. put us in good like, opportunities. Like Josh, in this phase, you need to be exactly. here. In this phase, maybe you mm-hmm. come a little deeper. In this phase, maybe you pull wide, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So we're essentially saying the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe there's a chance that Josh Sargent understands it and knows it, proves it against Cuba, and then maybe he start, goes up the pecking order mm. to be the... Uh, the preferred striker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's going to happen eventually, right? We just assume at some point young Josh Sargent becomes slightly less young and more experienced Josh Sargent and he's the US's number one striker. I, I would like that, that to be that the case. That day is coming. Yeah? I hope so. All right. I hope so. So at the very I've been, least... I've been burned too many times. <laughs> we're we're going to get a chance to see him yeah. against Cuba. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shall we finally pick our 11? No, I've got to do a couple more things. <laughs> First, I want to announce that we should probably do our 11 now. Okay. Okay. Here's a question before we do our 11. Mm-hmm. Are we assuming the same, uh, essentially, 4-3-3 shape that's like really a 4-4-2 when we're defending, but then a sort of uh, uh, 4-3-3 when we attack? Um, yeah, I think that's we probably right. We don't think there's like a weird thing where because it's Cuba, uh, Berhalter might be, all right, back three so we can get a few more people forward. I mean, may- maybe that's always a possibility, but that would surprise me. If, if, okay. we've, if we've been building and working on patterns of play and sequences and all of the terms and phrases he likes to use to then change it up and play an entirely different formation oh, would be very strange to me. we've had this discussion before, right, where the patterns of play don't necessarily change with the formation. The patterns of play can still be there. The formation is just a little different. Mm, yes, and I don't quite agree with how simple okay. you think that is. All right, so mm-hmm. we're going to go with an, sort of a 4-3-3 shape, yeah. mm-hmm. basically. Okay, let's start with the goalkeeper. Sure. Zach Steffen hasn't been training with the team. I think this is the perfect game for Sean Johnson. I agree. 
We're in? Okay. That, that, that's exactly where I am, too. Yeah. I mean, Brad no, Guzan doesn't need this. No disrespect to Brad Guzan, but I feel like we've also seen him more recently for the United States. For yeah. some reason, Sean Johnson seems to be like with the squad and then sent back to New York for the second game and yeah, yeah. hasn't gotten the opportunities. Um, and also, Brad Guzan has 61 caps at this point. Sean Johnson has eight. Yeah. So I wouldn't mind seeing Sean Johnson get a, a look here and then so, Zach Steffen, uh, health allowing for it plays yep. against Canada. So this is one of those picks that because it's Cuba and we expect to be dominant, mm-hmm. we can kind of take a risk and not like force our own looks like slightly injured first choice mm-hmm. goalkeeper to play, not have to lean on the more experienced guy because it's Cuba. This is a game we can give Sean Johnson another go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm with you. All right. All Sean right. Johnson in goal is our pick. Probably Zach Stefan against Canada when he's fully fit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, let's go center back. Okay. It's kind of tough, right? So it's what, Miazga, Reem, um, Zimmerman's out, Miles Robinson. Mm-hmm. Am I missing someone? Uh, Aaron Long. Yeah, you got him. There you okay. go. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, who's, who's your starting pair? I'm going to make you go first. That's fine. Uh, this is one where I would rather we go stronger, uh, like rather than like swap people around. I think I want to see – I think we missed Matt Miazga in the last international break due to injury. So maybe we do the kind of standard – like Tim. I'm just going to kind of jump around a little bit here. But maybe okay. it's like the Tim Ream as left back becoming left center back and then Miazga and Long. But I would actually rather see any two of Aaron Long, Matt Miazga, and Tim Ream as, as, like a, as your two center backs and have a more attacking – like natural left back option uh, start at left back. Okay, so let's go with that thing because mm-hmm. I think it's going to be key to how we build the back. I'm not four. sure that's available on the roster, but that's something well, I would like. The way I've built this is I've thought, yeah, we're going to be, I think we'll, we'll be sending probably Reggie Cannon or DeAndre Edlin forward yep. from right back down the right wing, right? They'll be joining the attack and then probably the right winger, be it Jordan Morris or Tyler Boyd, will start tucking inside. But I also think, again, because it's Cuba, we can afford to also have the left back get forward, right? Mm -hmm. Your choices are Daniel Lovitz, who he's really never done anything wrong. He's just not that glamorous and no one's that excited about him. Or, this is my pick, Nick Lima. Mm -hmm. Nick Lima at left back doing essentially a Serginho Dest impression. Okay. Right? As a right-footed left back. It's where he plays for San Jose. Um, I've loved Nick Lima for the national team. I think he deserves a chance to to have a go as an attacking left back. Okay. And then we just have two regular old centre-backs. That also makes sense from the perspective of, like, right now we have Yedlin and Cannon on that roster as right-back options. If Serginho Dest comes in, yeah, if he decides to play for the United States, that's another right-back. And I think Nick Lima has been a faithful servant, uh, is the best way to put it, under Berhalter. Every yeah. time I've seen him in a U.S. jersey under Berhalter, I've mm-hmm. been like, wow, Nick Lima's good. Yeah. All right. Nick Lima's dynamic. Nick Lima gets up and down. He joins the attack. He causes trouble. And it was Dest who switched to left side, right, uh, in the last round of friendlies? Yes, he played yeah. left back both times. So I doubt that we would see something where it's like Cannon left, Yedlin right. So if they were going to go with an attacking option, it does seem like it would most likely be Nick Lima. Yep. If it's not Nick Lima, then I think I do want it to be Tim Ream, and we just kind of continue to drill on the Ream becomes a left center back, we've got the other two center backs, yeah. the right back becomes more attacking, and we go with that to help us get a bit more familiarity. All right, so I'm going to uh, put all my cards on the table. I'm going to say Nick Lima left back. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say Tim Ream left center back because I want a left-footed left center back. Mm-hmm. Matt Miazga right center back, mostly because I just want him back in the team. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I also have that newfound appreciation of Tim Ream after we did the Americans Abroad uh, thing. And I watched a lot of Tim Ream at Fulham Footage, and I kind of started thinking, oh, I think Tim Ream's actually yeah. really good. Mm-hmm. And I think also Behelder likes him, right? He's made him captain. I think Aaron Long's form has dipped a little bit as well since there was a real high of Aaron Long in the Gold Cup, yep. right? I think it, I've seen him for Red Bulls a few times since. I've seen him for the US a few times since. Hasn't quite hit the same levels. So I, I'm not too worried about leaving Aaron Long out of this team this time. Yeah, okay? except, except Berhalter, as we know, is more of a like, what my guys, my group does for me is what I want them to do. And yeah. thus far, Long has performed the way Berhalter wants. I, he lives in some Tim Ream as well, though. I would like to see your approach. Yeah. What I think we will see is Tim Ream at left back, Aaron Long and Matt Miaz because you're two center backs. And I, it is a toss-up for me at right back for the Cuba game. Okay, so your options are mm-hmm. basically Reggie Cannon yeah. or the recently returned from injury DeAndre Yedlin. Right. And you could really make either argument for me, and I would buy into it. And, like, really, you could make either argument for, like, Yedlin as an example. Like, re- recently returned from injury, hasn't played for the national team in a very long time. I think this is his first camp for Berhalter. No, um, he's, played for, he's played for Berhalter. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, but at the very least, it's been a while then yeah. since he played for Berhalter. So 
do you want to bring him back and give him a sort of easier game where he can get more involved in the attack and show how he's developed? And get him ready for Canada almost? Yeah. Or do you want to get, let Reggie Cannon get the reps here and save Yedlin to bring him in against Canada and like put him in against stronger opposition and see how he does without risking like giving him any fatigue? I really could go either way on this one. I think I would rather see DeAndre Yedlin because it's been so long since we've seen him in a national team yeah. jersey. But I also will not be disappointed if it's Reggie Cannon. I would argue that Reggie Cannon has earned the right back spot mm-hmm. with his recent performances. And I wouldn't mind seeing, say, DeAndre Yedlin come off the bench for the final 30 minutes mm-hmm. and play in right back. Okay. Yeah. So, And I also think this pro- probably, again, it's worth reiterating that I think you taking the Nations League a bit more seriously than I do, Mm -hmm. I think you were kind of approaching this as like two competitive games. You want to start your best players to some extent, whereas I'm seeing it as like, Eh, Canada's Canada, and then, or excuse me, Cuba's Cuba, and then Canada is like a step Slightly, up. A lot tougher. So yeah. yeah, so I can't tell if that's but even a, then, like, like when we play Canada. If you say okay, we want our best right back against yeah. Canada, mm-hmm. I don't know the answer. Is it Reggie Cannon or is it DeAndre? Yedley? It's tough, right? I mean, there are be- people are going to be listening to this saying, well, one of them plays in the Premier League and one of them plays in MLS, mm-hmm. but it's never that simple, right? Just because Reggie Cannon plays in MLS now, we don't know where his ceiling is, mm-hmm. right? He could be a much, he could be as good as DeAndre Yedlin. Yeah. And and I am trying to kind of blend what I wouldn't mind seeing with what I think Burhalter will do. And what we have seen from Burhalter thus far in his tenure is even if he says, like, oh, you've got to be starting for the first team or you've got to be playing for a first team or whatever, it comes down to who can do what he wants the most readily and easily. Yeah. And right now I do think that's probably Reggie Cannon. I do think DeAndre Yedlin is probably the better soccer player right now overall. But either one I think I'm okay We're with. We're an R in here, aren't we? I'm going to make it. I'll, I'll say Yedlin. Let's start Yedlin okay. against Kibo. Why not? I'll tell you what. You gave me Lima. I'll give you Yedlin. All right. It's a total soccer show compromise. Oh, did I give you Lima? I mean, kind of. I think we can build our own. Why don't you just take Cannon and then we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do this then. Yeah. DeAndre Yedlin at right back. Mm-hmm. Miazga and Reem as the centre backs. Nick Lima as left back. That's what you wanted. That's the TSS official one. The TSS official one. The compromise between us. Okay, yeah. but are you saying that's what you want to happen? Well, I, I'm, again, I'm still I, I could go either way with Yedlin okay. and Cannon. Yeah. Well, it's more it's more the Lima thing that I'm like because I ha- want Lima to play left. back. But that's yeah. not a thing that he has done before or been suggested for no. the national team, right? Uh, no, but okay. I wanted to. Happen. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Let's move to midfield. Should we do that or should we talk about our other sponsor for the day? Let's talk about our other sponsor for there the day. There we go. <laughs> Today's show is also <laughs> sponsored by Roughneck Scarves. Yeah. Uh, Roughneck Scarves, the official scarf providers of, among other organizations, mm-hmm. the U.S. Soccer Federation. So these are officially licensed U.S. soccer scarves that you can buy at roughneckscarves.com. Mm-hmm. You can also custom design your own scarf. That you can. And have whatever you want on it. So I, put, I asked a question on Twitter. If you were to design a Roughneck scarf to take to the USA Cuba game on Friday, you'd have to get kind of a rush job at this point because you're probably hearing this Thursday night, Friday morning. Um, what would you design if you mm-hmm. could do the custom design? Uh, we got many responses. I've chosen four. <laughs> yeah, I think you curated this well to remove all of the ones were like a dumpster fire and yeah, sadness. Just, honestly, the pointless negativity about the U.S. men's national team that mm-hmm. I don't need going into a game that I want to enjoy. Uh, and on that note, too harsh. Thank you, Matt Doyle, for just tweeting a gif of Al Bundy with a noose around his neck. Yeah, <laughs> come on, you've got better taste in TV than that, Matt Doyle. At the very least. How dare you? All right. How dare you? Custom scars for this game. First one, Costa Caliagas. Mm-hmm. Costa Caliagas says, just on his scarf, he would have. An attempt to explain to everyone how the CONCACAF Nations League works. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. I think the other side would be Daryl with a long like text bubble explaining how the Nations yes, League works. I'm good with that. Absolutely. Patrick Keeler suggests JFK on one side, uh, Khrushchev on the other. I'm, this is Cuban Missile Crisis? I would assume so, yes. Uh, just one person's would face, though. Khrushchev? It's going to be stretched out. Probably not. No. They should. Who played him in the death of Stalin? They I should just have that Steve person do Buscemi? it. Really? Yeah. Weird. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> have right. you seen that movie, by the way? I have not yet, no. One, you would love it. Mm-hmm. I, I think the other great thing about it I had this conversation is, with my brother earlier in the week. Has he seen it? Yes. Oh, FG is the best. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody's doing a Russian accent. Everyone's just yeah. talking in their normal accent. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect, perfect choice. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure it's Steve Buscemi as Khrushchev just talking like Steve Buscemi. I forget who plays Berea, but whoever it is, I hope they took a lot of showers after playing that man. <laughs> uh, next one comes from Hey, I'm Matt, who says, we welcome you potential defectors. <laughs> That's kind of like a refugee's welcome. Yeah, I think yeah? the flip side to that is written in Spanish, I would guess. I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. Um, Antonio Yat Jr., mm-hmm. a team photo of Adams, Pulisic, Weyer, Weston McKenney, and Miles Robertson with the words, there's always the 2026 World Cup. 
No this, one, this is the most negative one that's crept through. No disrespect to Miles Robinson. I'm going to assume that Antonio is an Atlanta fan, but one of those things is not like the other. <laughs> you know Adam Spulisic, Wea Weston, all sort of established European players. Yeah. All of whom, all of whom, all of whom have played in the Champions League or are playing in the Champions League or could if they're not sitting on the bench. Yeah. Miles Robinson, a little ways to go, I think, before I'm going to put him in that class. He'll get there one day. He he'll will. Get, he'll get there one day. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, you can um, create custom scarves and then essentially you can make a profit mm-hmm. selling them. You can just make a profit because you want to make money. You can raise money for a non-profit, which mm-hmm. is a bit more um, altruistic. You said it a minute ago. I have the Refugees Welcome Scarf, which was a custom, yes, uh, you do. custom one. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so, yeah, you can make scarves mm-hmm. like that. Um, you can also just straight up buy scarves yeah. that are already in the Roughneck Scarf store. Lots of U.S. men's national team scarves. Lots of U.S. women's national team scarves. Mm-hmm. Lots of major league soccer scarves. Playoffs are coming, so you can rep your team that way. Yep. I said in the summer they have the lightweight ones. We're getting into the fall slash the winter, so you can get the the thicker ones, the more uh, cold weather ones yeah. for MLS playoffs, for USL playoffs. I like that you think people will actually wear scarves around their neck and not wave them in the air. I mean, you could do both. You could you do, do both. Yeah, they, they work that way that you could take them off. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Or you are, could buy two, one around the neck, one to wave in the air. Scarves are amazing. They are. Um, all the prices you see, mm-hmm. take 20% off. Yeah, why not? Any price you see, take Just 20% off. Because when you enter the discount code Total Soccer Show for any scarf you see at roughnetscarves.com, you will get 20% off. Total Soccer Show, all one word. Link and the code will, of course, be in the show notes. It's also listed on our advertisers page, totalsoccershow.com slash advertisers, which now that I'm out of the hospital and back to full fitness, um, I have updated. Mm-hmm. So finally, you have all the advertisers, all the current advertisers, all the current discount codes at totalsoccershow.com slash advertisers. I had to promote it because I spent two hours updating it late last night. So thank you to Roughneck Scarves for sponsoring today's episode. And thank you to Jackson Ewell for starting as the number six. You have that? <laughs> yes. I have that too. Yeah. Well, okay, why do, I mean, I have my argument for it. Why do you have Jackson Yule starting in what's essentially the Michael Bradley slash Will Trap role? Because I, I don't think Berhalter, here's my breakdown. I don't think Berhalter wants to play Bradley two full games or even start him two full games in, a, like, in less than a week time frame. So I think Bradley starts against Canada. So then in my mind it becomes, is it Will Trap or Jackson Yule? No disrespect. I have seen enough of Will Trap. I enjoyed what I saw from Jackson Yule against Uruguay admittedly a Uruguay team that were not like aggressively pressing or causing that big of issues. But even then, you was able to find space, find time, play the balls that we've come it's to arguably see. arguably more impressive because mm-hmm. they're not pressing. They're yeah. a bit more compact. It was harder to find space to hit those passes, yeah. and he still did it. Yeah, and so I want to see him continue to do that against Cuba, and then I think Bradley starts against Canada. That's why I have Yule in there. I also I actually agree with everything you just said. I also think the um, the way we talked about Cuba's setup earlier – um, the way that there'll be a little bit of space between the lines, they'll be uh, like laterally, um, laterally pressuring so that that big switch is on. I think Jackson Yule will find more creative ways to switch the ball mm-hmm. than just Michael Bradley and Will Trap hitting those big lofted diagonals. Like a lot of Jackson Yule's passes seem to like go through weird angles. I just think it'll be uh, there'll be a, there'll be more creative passing from Jackson Yule than the other two. Really? Yeah, I think he's a more adventurous passer, essentially. Takes higher risks right. than the other two. And maybe, okay, maybe the occasional one won't come off, but then Cuba will try and counterattack, and then Cuba will in trouble. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there, there we go. Yeah, and also, we can risk it, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe he's not the most experienced or the best of those number sixes, but again, it's Cuba, it's worth the risk. Yep. Mm-hmm. So this is the game where we risk Sergeant over Zardes, and we risk Yule over Trap. Yep. And maybe they get to prove themselves and permanently move themselves up the pecking order. Maybe. I can't believe that they were so easy to agree on Jackson Yule as the number six. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I really liked what I saw uh, from him against yeah. Uruguay, and I just I have not been as impressed by Will Trapp. I don't think he does enough of the things that he does well. Yeah. Great, basically. Uh-huh. And then I think the stuff that is like negative in his game can be easily exploited and mm-hmm. I think isn't as easily covered, especially in the way the U.S. plays. So that's where I have Yule. I have Weston McKinney starting both of these games. Okay, so That's Weston, my next one. So Weston McKinney is the mm-hmm. 8 slash 10, yep. right, who could theoretically sit alongside Yule in mm-hmm. the Bradley slash Trap role, but will mostly be um, advancing beyond and being like the right, slanted right attacking midfielder. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Weston McKenney. Yes. Away you go. I have, I, mean, him, I have him from both of these because honestly, I want to see him play for both of these. I think he yeah, can, yeah. he's more than capable of handling that. But also, it will just be too too disappointing if the game against Cuba is completely experimental. Yeah. Then it's like, oh, great. We get to see them in the second game, but not this one. The good news is mm-hmm. um, if... If McKenney doesn't play, for example, the other options in midfield are 
66.666% players that I want to see. Really? So Sebastian Lejet, mm-hmm. I've been really impressed by. I think he's um, a really sort of dynamic attacking midfielder. Um, and Brendan Aronson, the 18-year-old, I'm excited to see in a US jersey. So if it's either of those two, it's probably not going to be as the number eight, right? What I don't want to see is Christian Roldan, is what I'm mm-hmm. getting at. Yeah. Because I think I've seen enough of Christian Roldan. Um, if it's either of the other two, I'll be at least saying, okay, it's experimental, I'm interested. But like you, I'm I'm on the, I hope it's Weston McKinney because I just can't get enough of watching him, essentially. I can't believe you would say that about Christian Roldan. Seattle fans, it wasn't me this time. Email Daryl this time. <laughs> Daryl's the one who doesn't like him. My email address is <laughs> T-A-Y-L-O-R do at Total Soccer <laughs> That's Show. That's how you spell Daryl. Yeah. Here's what I think could be great about Weston McKinney yep. as well is if you just start a little deeper in the possession phase, we talked about the gap between defense and midfield that mm-hmm. Cuba, they do, they leave a gap between the two lines, right, because of this mid block. I like the idea of Weston McKenney sneaking in late to occupy space between the lines. So rather than just standing there and waiting for the ball to come to him, he can sort of just dart in there as play is building up. And then suddenly, they're, Cuba are in trouble because McKenney's appeared and he's in front of their defense. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I, I, yeah, I agree with everything. And then I'm going to add one more reason why I want to see Weston McKenney. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, a thing we saw from Cuba playing Canada, and I think we saw from the last time the United States went to Cuba to play Cuba, uh, is that they have no problem being physical. And that is yeah. one thing that Cuba will do is they will play physical. They will they will get some kicks in. They will pull jerseys. They will slow down attacking opportunities for the United States. Weston McKinney is more than capable of playing a physical game. Yeah. And I like the idea of having somebody in there who can... He's up for a scrap. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, I think his official policy is, if you hit me, I will hit you back. Yes. <laughs> if you kick me, I will kick you back. Is he competitive? I got no problem right? with that. Yeah. The, I think the other thing is, the U.S. is going to get fouled, mm-hmm. right? So guys like Pulisic and McKinney are going to get fouled like maybe 40 yards from goal right that just will happen at some point during this game um which means we're going to be sending free kicks into the box i still think weston mckenney along with our center backs is an aerial threat right mm-hmm. so you get weston mckenney in the box on the end of some cross some free kick crosses i think that's a, a dangerous player to have in there mm-hmm. so that'd be a thing to look out for yeah i agree yeah. all right so weston mckenney weston and then uh despite Everything we said about Cuba, Cuba being physical, there's going to be some kicks, there's going to be some fouls. I want Christian Pulisic playing both of these games as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you want Christian Pulisic as the left-sided number 10? But essentially, the role that Berhalter has been playing him in every game he's played Christian Pulisic. I mean, yes. You do? Okay. <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, I tend to say I'd rather see what he can do out wide because I think that's where he's more comfortable because that's where he has played most of his career. Yeah. Um, in this case, though, if if you're going to go with what Berhalter has asked of him to be the kind of main creator and provider for the U.S. against a team that maybe are going to be a little bit more defensive at times, are going to be physical, are going to require somebody to be smart and find space and find time and link up play, I mean, that is what Ber- Pulisic is supposed to be for Greg Berhalter. Yeah. So to move him out wide at a time when like it seems like the ideal game to play him central would be confusing, even if I do think that would be effective against stronger opposition. And there's also, we had like a longer version of this conversation with Bobby and mm-hmm. Susanna on Extra Time this morning, so I don't want to repeat it, but it is part of the, the uh, Berhalter system that uh, Pulisic as the left attacking centre mid interchanges with the person that's playing actual left wing, right? Mm-hmm. So you will get, uh, in my lineup, it's Paul Ariola will drift in field and yep. Pulisic will drift out wide. And I actually think he could have an element of surprise with the way that Cuba, again, are so narrow and shuffle over and we can switch play and there'll be space on one side. If we do that at the same time as Ariola and Pulisic switching, I think Pulisic could sort of have the element of surprise um, on mm-hmm. Cuba and suddenly yep. we'll have space to to run at people um, and exploit mm-hmm. yeah um, so yeah I think that could be exciting the other thing is if we are going to counter their failed counter attacks it wouldn't be a bad thing if we like win the ball back and give it Pulisic mm-hmm. and they're all discombobulated because they thought they were going to have a counter attack suddenly you've got Chrissy P running at you I, I think that's a good situation for the United States Chrissy P yeah. really all yeah, right just that one time. All right, I won't fine. be saying it again. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've got uh, Pulisic Central. If you did have him played wide, then I guess that would be then Sebastian Legette starting in that yes. spot. Uh, but I would ass- my, my assumption would be, and this is another reason why I think we might not see that high of a scoreline, because if the United States gets up, say it is 3-0 at halftime, I think you do see 
some of those players like a Christian Pulisic subbed off and I also think it would make sense right save them for Canada don't run the legs off but then I also think we've been in those games where if you're up 4 or 5 nil with 40 minutes to go maybe you just take your foot off a little bit and you work on passing it you don't want to exert yourself you don't want to get too tired you don't want to risk an injury well I I don't even mean from a substitution standpoint I mean like if you're one of those center backs you're not going to go bombing forward to try to make something happen you're maybe going to stay back a little bit more I don't know is it 3 and a half nil yet or not (laughs) I said if it's 3 nil at halftime okay yeah <laughs> um, yes, okay, so we've got that midfield. Uh, I'm with you that I think Paul Ariola will yeah. uh, start. We missed him in the September friendlies. We miss his energy. Mm-hmm. I think he's so hardworking, so quick. He's actually a really quick player. Mm-hmm. He, actually, he just adds a lot of like dynamism to that left wing. Yeah. And I still think he has the best connection with Pulisic in terms of that left center mid, left attacking center mid, left wing. Um, it, it's a partnership. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think I'm, I see no reason to break up that partnership for Corey Baird or Tyler Boyd mm-hmm. or Jordan Morris to play on the left wing. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. And okay. also, Paul Ariola can scrap. He so sure can scrap. Uh, that's yeah, going to be so important. If it's going to be a scrap, mm-hmm. you want Paul Ariola out there. Also, Audi Field, right? He's at home. Like There is something to be said for playing someone in front at their home stadium in front of some of his home fans. And that number five I mentioned for Cuba, again, <laughs> yeah. not so strong defensively. And I think Paul Ariola, sort of in that like shoulder-to-shoulder challenge when he has the ball at his feet, yeah. will be able to knock that defender off and then play a ball in. And I, I'm suddenly quite excited at the idea of Paul Ariola and like maybe Nick Lima overlapping and then Christian Pulisic either underlapping mm-hmm. or overlapping. And you've suddenly got a combination of those three going at that right back. <laughs> I'm excited for you to be excited about that. And I'm hoping you won't be too bummed when it's actually Tim Ream 40 yards back applauding as Paul <laughs> Ariola does things. <laughs> well, but yeah. De- de- if he's doing applause with your things, maybe it'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> true. Um, on the right side, I yeah. feel like we're going to have a similar conversation, or at least where my head is, to what we had with the right back spot. Yeah. Because there are arguments to be made for starting Tyler Boyd. There are arguments to be made for starting Jordan Morris. And I'm sort of at a toss-up here because I would rather – Strangely for me, it's it's been a strange process this year. I would rather see Jordan Morris start both of these. Yeah, games. yeah, he's in form. Mm-hmm. He deserves it. I think Jordan Morris is the choice at, at right yeah. wing. Yeah, and especially if it's Reggie Cannon pushing forward, and then the right winger <laughs> shifts inside mm-hmm. and sort of becomes a second striker. I think it's perfect for Jordan Morris. Yeah. But if you have an out of form Tyler Boyd who needs a little bit of confidence, yeah. taking on Cuban defenders one on one, that does seem like a thing that he would like to do. He is very good at at one v one attacking. Yeah, duels. it's true. It might be a good game for him. And yeah. also, he is not that good at crossing. But I think in this game, maybe crossing will be less important. Is yeah. my hope. Uh, with that said, I think I'd rather see Jordan Morris because, again, thus far he has proven that he can excel or at the very least operate successfully in Greg yep. Berhalter's system and has rewarded that faith with goals and solid performances. Yeah, I think, yeah, just Jordan Morris has earned it. So I think Jordan Morris should play uh, mm-hmm. against Cuba. The one other option that I think is interesting is uh, Sebastian Legette. Mm-hmm. Um So Sebastian Legette, do you remember when um, Behalter uh, talked about the Gold Cup roster? He said one of the reasons that Dwayne Holmes wasn't included is that uh, if he'd been able to include Sebastian Legette, there would have been a lot more positional flexibility because he can play attacking midfield or he can play on the wing. Mm-hmm. So I do think there's there's always a chance that we see Leggett played out wide, maybe as a sub, maybe even starting, because I know that uh, Bearhalter likes him, but maybe doesn't like him enough to pick him ahead of, say, Pulisic and McKenney. Mm-hmm. So if he's going to try and force Leggett into this squad somewhere, you could, I'm not saying it will happen, but you could see Sebastian Leggett as a right winger. See, I took that quote to mean more that like he is able to interchange the way Pulisic and Areola do, where Pulisic sometimes goes wide and Areola comes central. Okay. And Leggett is equally capable of sort of swapping. Oh, and so you don't think back. it meant he actually can play on the wing for me? Yeah, I think he's more. I, that's how I interpreted that, All but right, I enough. could well be wrong. Maybe we see him on the right. Who knows? Uh, who, who knows, knows Dale? Who we'll, knows? We'll, we'll find mm-hmm. out Friday night. And yeah. then I guess we've already talked about Josh Sargent at length have we? right about yeah we, we have right about you want jesse's artist to start right i got you i want josh Sargent mm-hmm. to not just like be a menace and score goals and be a threat to cuba which i think he will i think it could be a good game for him maybe to get a couple of u.s goals uh but we really want him to uh perform the positional role that greg berhalter has asked him to perform yeah and i think that will go down as a massive check mark in Greg Berhalter's big book of tactics. I have a slightly difficult question for you, slash potentially very difficult question. I'm what, backing myself to answer it. What do you think that looks like specifically? Because there are obviously things that Zardes could do or knew how to do already that Josh Sargent did not, and that maybe other forwards did not. So when we see Sargent in this game, 
I don't mean goals necessarily or like, oh, he had that gr- one great pass. Like, what do you think it is that Burhalter is looking for from his striker? Not even against like weaker opponents, but just generally speaking, so that we can sort of see did Sargent do roughly what we think has been asked of him? I think uh, with positional play, mm-hmm. which is what Berhalter calls. Did it. I drag that question out long enough for you to come up with an answer? Yes, you All right, did. Cool, cool, with cool. positional play, which is what Berhalter calls it, you're supposed to be in certain positions on the field during uh, very specific sort of. Uh, phases of play and phases of possession Mm -hmm. as in if we have the ball here you should be here right if you've seen you've probably seen Guardiola like lay out the grid system that he went I I can't remember if it was at Barca or Bayern or Man City but so that he can instruct players that you've got to be in like this part of the grid when the ball is here Mm -hmm. right so then it's all coordinated movement of everybody knows where they're supposed to be at particular times right so we know that Josh Sargent I've seen him do it for Bremen, can come short and show for the ball and like receive the ball, take a touch away from pressure and lay it off to someone. Mm-hmm. So we know he can do that. I've seen him do it for the US against Uruguay. But is he doing it at the times and during the phase of play that Bear Helter's asking him to do it, right? Because it could even be that he comes short and receives the ball and we're like, oh, that was a good little hold-up play touch from Josh Sargent. But Bear Helter might be sitting there thinking... Yeah, but he was supposed to be pushing up on the centre-back yeah. at that time, right? So stuff that we might not know what he's supposed to be doing, and he might even be doing something that impresses us, uh, but it might not be the thing Berhalter was asking him to do in that moment. So I was already excited about this game. Uh, did all that for, make sense, by the way? It did. Uh, I was already excited for the reasons that we've already discussed and pushing chips all in, but also because I agree with everything you've said, and it does make sense. It's really difficult to track on the screen because yeah. you don't see what's happening off screen if Josh Sargent is like moving into the channel to be an outlet for a long ball or something like that. But we will be there in person. So we will be able yes. to see what Josh Sargent is, does and has, is doing or has not done. Yeah. And more importantly, we'll be able to ask Greg Berhalter, what were you looking for from Josh mm. Sargent? Did he do the things you wanted to see him do? What does he still need to work on? All right, and so you've already got your press conference question. Maybe. We'll see. Put, we'll your, see. put your hand up now and hope that Michael Cameron will <laughs> select you. He won't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and if he does, it will be like, Grant, Stephen, <laughs> Jeff, guy in the back. I was? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Guy in the back. Anybody else? Beard guy. Yeah. Put your hand down. Beardy. Beardy, <laughs> shut up. Yeah. N- Nuno Santos. <laughs> At least I'm not wearing flip-flops this time. <laughs> you are a much more experienced journalist than so I, I would, 2010. I still would never say that I'm a journalist, but I appreciate everything a else you said. much more experienced uh, Talker into a micer. Media holder? Yeah. Media critic. There we holder. go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lanyard wearer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I am somewhat looking forward to this game. Mm-hmm. I know it's only USA Cuba. I know not everyone's excited, as excited about the CONCACAF Nations League as I am. But if you look at it as a chance for Sargent to prove something, for Jackson Yule to prove something. Uh, for the entire squad to prove something. I genuinely yeah. am saying, like, for the entire squad to show. Oh, you all forgot your chips are in. Yeah, man. That, like, this is the opportunity for everyone to show this is what we've been working on and we know how to execute it against a team that we should be able to execute executed against yes all right anything else that you would in a like, competitive format quote unquote anything else that you'd like to see like I've mentioned a couple of times I would love to see uh, Brendan Aronson get off the bench mm. and get a at least a taste of international football here it's more likely against Cuba than against Canada right I would like to not be disappointed at the end of this game <laughs> I know that's I know that's like a, a generic answer but there has been so much negativity surrounding the national team. I've said this to you several times in the last week, but also pretty much every soccer team I like has had a not great season yeah. or is in the middle of having a not great season, depending on the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes it frustrating to like... like you when can we, watch Wolves with me anytime. I'm good. Uh, I mean, even even Wolves, they're not like tearing the world apart. But like... I would like to not. To, I'd like to have a game where Aspect like we're still, we're still going to get negative people. Um, but I would like to be able to walk away thinking like, okay, we saw this. This was definitely progress. I saw that. As opposed to having yes. to be like, well, there was that one sequence where we completed four passes in a row. That was really exciting. Like, yeah. I don't want to have to scrounge for positive things to say. <laughs> those chips are in, man. And if those chips don't come back, I'm I'm gonna be real mad. Wow, <laughs> real real mad. All right, you can take it out in the house. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Slash the press box, yes. All right, so the game is Friday night, 7.06 p.m. kickoff, mm-hmm. I believe is the um, official kickoff time. Uh, we'll be watching on Fox Sports 1. No, we won't. We'll be at the stadium. We will be at the stadium. We'll be DVRing on Fox Sports 1 via Fubo TV so we can rewatch things very quickly if we need to yeah. uh, straight after the game. That's mm-hmm. another good uh, uh, good use of it. Good call. Yeah. There we go. Um, so expect a review show from us. Friday night, we should record straight after the game. We'll find a little corner of Audi Field. Ish. To, straight ish after to the game. To record a show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, anything else to add, Tyler, before we wrap this up? That's it. Okay. Oh, one thing I do want to add. 
We finally recorded another episode of Sucker 101. Mm-hmm. Sucker 101's coming back. If you haven't heard of Sucker 101, now's a good time to go and find our spin off show and give it a listen. I vouch for it. It's good stuff. <laughs> So, Taylor Rockwell, anything to say? Ain't nothing to say. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today, and I'll see you tomorrow <laughs> when we go up to see the USA versus Cuba. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.